Welcome everyone to the next episode of Bones and Stones. Today we've got Brent Sinclair Thompson who's joined us to talk a bit about his PhD. You'll notice there's a slight receding hairline there. That means he has submitted very recently. <laughs> uh, Brent, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, after the earlier comment, I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, Brent submitted in April this year, so he's sort of fresh off the boat in terms of getting that uh, that PhD off of his shoulders. Um, still waiting reviews, which we all were chatting about it just now. We hope they're very positive. Um, his work's really interesting. He's going to chat a bit about it now. Um, and it's it's exciting to see the kind of stuff that's coming out at the moment. So I'm not going to sort of jump into it, Brent, but I'll let you, if you could just introduce us to to your work and to some of your findings. Cool. Okay. Well, first of all, yeah, I mean, thanks for having me on the show. That's awesome. I'm really excited about this. Um, yeah, so what my PhD is basically about is um, looking at the uh, rock art of uh, bandit groups along uh, what used to be the old uh, eastern frontier of the Cape Colony in the late, uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, I've, uh, a lot of my focus has been going through uh, historical sources from the time, so lots of things written by uh, missionaries, settlers, travelers, etc., cetera, um, describing these uh, basically mixed groups of bandits, so including um, people from uh, Khoi or San uh, backgrounds, as well as African farmers and then also uh, runaway slaves um, amongst uh, these same groups and um, going through these uh, these records and then going and doing field work in the area where they're describing these groups as hanging out we find these uh, rock paintings which are definitely from the colonial period I mean it's uh, paintings of uh, people on uh, horseback with firearms uh, often uh, seemingly chasing a castle and then um, quite often also um, sort of uh, otherworldly beings from kind of the San cosmology interspersed amongst, um, well, well, within there as well. So we see, for instance, rain animals um, coming up. Um, we also see uh, baboons and ostriches and other um, creatures that uh, appear in earlier um, fine line San art also appearing in this stuff. But it seems to be under a different kind of context, you know. And, then, and um, yeah, so, uh, no, I'll just hand it in. Well, just hand it in back in April. And, um, Basically, I mean, what I've tried to do is just sort of marry the history, which is kind of the colonial interpretation, if you will, quite a large degree, and then um, the rock art and use that as an archive in its own kind of right, and uh, to get a more sort of a nuanced understanding of uh, what this history was like there at the time, um, what these groups were doing, which, um, I mean, typically they were resisting colonialism uh, through uh, stock theft. So um, stealing uh, livestock from the farmers, um, in some cases, uh, killing livestock outright so that farmers, uh, well, I mean, European farmers couldn't um, sort of retrieve their herds and uh, essentially trying to hurt them economically um, as best they could. But I mean, there were multiple reasons for why they were, were uh, kind of rebelling against the farmers. And I think, you know, we can probably discuss that as we go through uh, the show. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Brent. That's really interesting. Um, I sort of have two kind of questions. One, I think, is probably a bit easier than the other. In terms of these groups, there's, there's obviously a bunch of them around Southern Africa in the sort of 1800s and so on. Um, who, who were they made up of? Like, what kind of people were part of these groups? That's the one question. Like, you know, what was the mixture, basically? And the second question is a number of scholars have written about ex getting history from rock art or developing historical sequences uh, from rock art itself. People like Aaron Maisel and so on. Um, in, in, in the work that you've been doing, is that something that you can achieve? Because it's been heavily discussed, heavily debated. Is that something you feel you can achieve through the kind of rock art that you've been looking at? Um, okay, so to answer the first question as to what sort of individuals are making up these groups. Um, now, you're going to have to excuse me. Unfortunately, I have to use some pejorative language just to quote the historical sources of that's okay, right? Um, Typically, these groups get described as consisting of, uh, quote, bushmen, hottentots, and runaway slaves. Now, what exactly those labels meant back then um, has been fiercely debated. You know, we tend to think now that uh, the idea of a, of a bushman was kind of an ethnic San person. A, um, the colonial description of hottentot was an ethnic Khoi speaker. And uh, we then kind of think of runaway slaves as being um, typically from, uh, well, I mean, you've discussed slavery on here before. So slaves from outside of uh, Southern Africa. So um, typically taken from uh, the, um, the Indian Ocean tr uh, slave trade and early on from the Atlantic slave trade. Um, 
However, when we start sort of interrogating these terms into um, a little bit further, we find that, I mean, the term Bushman, for example, gets applied to a multitude of people. And we can never really say specifically whether it's people who are hunter-gatherers or people who are um, pastoralists. One of the main things, though, is that it usually gets referred to people who are raiders. Um, so, you know, the, the sort of, it, it does muddy kind of like ideas of ethnic essentialism. Um, mm. But the primary thing is that they seems to be applied to bandits. Uh, likewise, the term Hottentot, which often gets thought to, you know, equal Khoi speaker. Um, but that term also gets applied to hunter-gatherers who have a working relationship with the colony. And seem, it seems to, from an economic perspective, kind of deal more with those sorts of people, people who have a, um, as opposed to the Bushmen who have an antagonistic relationship with the colony, Hottentots often get, um, the term often gets applied to people who have uh, more of a um, sort of, well, on the colony side, a positive uh, working relationship with them. And then as for runaway slaves, um, yes, I mean, certainly there are slaves uh, coming from um, outside of uh, South Africa. However, especially in this area, there's also, an illegal, well, according to colonial law, at least, there's an illegal slave trade. Um, you know, uh, the w w when the Dutch East India Company set up here, I mean, they basically um, forbid uh, Van Riebeck from enslaving the local population. Mm -hmm. And um, while that may have, you know, occurred initially, at least in the Cape, we don't see that, uh, we, we don't see people abiding by those uh, laws that are kind of out on, um, in the borderlands. Um, in those areas, you've got, uh, typically it's the uh, poorer European farmers who are moving out there um, and uh, sort of as uh, land is expanding, well, as the colony is expanding. And um, for them, you know, to get hold of cheap labor, it's quite a risky, you know, if you say, for example, if you're setting around crop and it, it's quite a, um, a risky endeavor to, leave your farm there, head all the way to the Cape, pick up slaves and then transport them back, right? It's also expensive. It's far easier on the other hand, if you grab, you know, your buddies and you all get on horses and you pack your muskets and off you head into where you know that there are crawls of, um, of uh, pastoralists or of hunter gatherers. And this would typically happen is they'd go through, massacre the men and um, take the women and children and uh, raise the children um, on uh, colonial farms under a system that was essentially, I mean, they call it the Inbookstel cell system, but it was basically um, slavery. I mean, they were supposed to have uh, various rights, which they were hardly ever granted. And um, so Sam Chalice and I have recently written a paper, um, and it's one of the papers that's in the PhD, uh, about these uh, runaway slaves, where a lot of these people, they're the ones who are absconding from farms because they're being uh, mistreated, and essentially, you know, so when we hear the term runaway slave, we need to think that actually this might also apply to um, local South Africans, um, well, sorry, local people in Southern Africa who were sort of enslaved as well. It's not just the case to say that, you know, this would apply only to external slaves. So, um, yeah, I mean, basically very sort of mixed kind of uh, groups. Um, okay, let me hold on for a second. I'll go on a bit now, just now. Uh, thanks, Brent. That's uh, that's really interesting. It, it really sounds like um, there was such a dynamic landscape, uh, you know, at that point in time. But if I could maybe just bring it back to the actual um, to the rock art itself, um, you know, you mentioned uh, some of the depictions of of men on horseback. So we know that we're dealing with a colonial period. But given that it was such a vibrant landscape and there was obviously lots of going on, presumably lots of conflict as well. If there's you know theft of livestock and stuff in the actual rock art. What else is depicted that, that talks to this kind of vibrant kind of uh, landscape? Um, I think, you know, beyond the subject matter itself is um, also the way that things are depicted. So, um, you know, I, we have historical accounts, like I said, describing these bands as being very, very mixed. And what's interesting is when you go to the, these rock art sites, the paintings are very mixed as well. Um, and I mean, I've written about this, we're especially looking for conventions in paintings. You know, if you think of like San Fine Line and Rock Art, you can go to a shelter and you can see, you know, 200 Elant painted there in the sort of old uh, traditional style. Um, and they all look much the same, right? Whereas you go into these shelters and what seems to be the exact same painting, you've got one horse, I'm sorry, one, uh, the exact same panel rather, one horse is done in finger painting. Next to it, there's a horse that's done where... Uh, oh, wow. Uh, um, the mane has been um, emphasized uh, to a large degree. Then the next horse has um, been painted again in like a sort of more scratch technique or something where the feet look vastly different to the one next to it. And it almost looks like different individuals are putting um, these images together 
And um, it's not, and then they're kind of always creating their own tradition in the process, um, their own rock art tradition, where it doesn't have uh, these sort of uh, formalities that are followed. And I think that's very, very interesting. We can actually look at a panel and say, you know, this looks like it was done by either, you know, five different people at the exact same time, or alternatively, the shelter was kind of, you know, used again and again by different groups who were adding on to these paintings, each in their own way, and kind of bringing um, their own understanding of painting uh, to it. I think that also speaks to the sort of, yeah, the mixed nature of these groups. Sorry, and then in terms of chronology, when when do you expect this kind of art to have started and to have ended? And, and do you have a tight enough chronology to say something about that? Look, um, okay, so here, I mean, I, I, again, I use the historical sources and the rock art itself. Um, the historical sources for, uh, like, where I do most of my work, I mean, is uh, in the Winterberg Mountain Range. Um, we find uh, the first cases of raids. Um, against uh, settlers occurring there in the sort of late uh, 1770s. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, at this point, uh, the Great Fisher River had uh, been made um, the official uh, colonial boundary um, in uh, 1778. However, there were already settlers who were beyond that boundary in the Winterberg, which is where I'm interested, um, from uh, sort of mid-1770s. And as soon as travelers start going to visit that area they're hearing stories from these farmers saying you know we're being hit um basically these guys are you know they're taking our cattle uh, or they're uh, killing our horses burning our farms in some cases um so that seems to be kind of like when i think the likelihood is when these paintings start with that activity um and then um certainly by uh, 1826 in the Winterberg, there's no more raids after that like um not from these uh, groups like this at least um, by that point, uh, they've either been, you know, all of them have been murdered by um, uh, commandos um, or uh, they've been uh, forced to flee or others have been forced uh, to kind of uh, work on um, colonial farms. Yeah. And then, so, I mean, I mean, this is probably something that maybe come, you know, so from your own opinion, but why were they painting this? Why were they painting themselves? What, what, what do you have any thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, okay, again, you know, we can't, we, I think we know, now know that, you know, we can't look at rock art and go, right, you know, that's a picture that somebody did for fun. You know, it's loads of fun to paint Eland, so I'm going to paint me an Eland. Um, likewise, looking at uh, the uh, the colonial era paintings, you know, I mean, the, the old interpretations, of course, was uh, were that uh, these guys are painting, or women are painting colonists. Um, and uh, this sort of heavily sort of ethnic essentialism, this idea that, you know, if you see a painting of somebody on a horse holding a gun, wearing a hat, that's a colonist. And um, the, uh, the the painters are doing this because they're kind of overawed by um, this new experience of meeting these people, whatever rubbish that might have been. Um, we now know that, I mean, these individuals themselves get hold of horses from uh, very, very early on. They get hold of guns early on. I mean, these also two of the, uh, the, the things that they're stealing from farms. Um, so, and, and they're wearing European style clothing. So you can't look at these paintings and see that. Um, and then say, okay, well, that's a painting of a European. I think more likely these people are painting themselves. As for, you know, the kind of reasons why, I think that's especially gets spoken to where we start seeing images of uh, rain animals, for instance. We know that um, most of the raids take place during rain, um, like uh, the, the rainy sort of season or um, during uh, times when it's, it's raining. The advantages of this is that, um, well, one, uh, the mist that comes with rain, especially in these mountains, uh, acts as a sort of camouflage. And um, so they can go in and uh, they can steal, you know, what they need to, sort of um, under cover of uh, mist. And on the other hand as well, rain also washes away tracks of stolen animals. So it makes it very difficult to pursue you. So, you know, we've seen rain, depictions of rain animals going back in, uh, in sort of fine line sand rock, or, you know, thousands of years. And um, this idea of this relationship with the rain creature, that this is something that you call on, uh, sort of in a spirit world, and um, that uh, these paintings deal with that spirit well, you know, sort of reflect that spirit world. So I think that um, a lot of the the reason for why they're doing these paintings is basically to as a form of protection and um, and assistance uh, during these raids to sort of you know facilitate the raids, if you will. Yeah, I mean that's really it's really interesting that connection with the sort of what you typically associate with rock art in, 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 from a hunter-gatherer perspective and then what you get now as well. And what's really cool yeah. about this kind of work is that it starts to, it speaks to an entire history and sequence and um, identity 
that has largely sort of been neglected and ignored in colonial recordings and colonial uh, recollections of what was going on in these landscapes in South Africa. And through the art, you're able to sort of tap into some of this. Yeah, absolutely, man. I think, and that's where, you know, the, the, the art sort of stands on its, um, as its own kind of archive when you're looking at that and saying, well, because I mean, they're painting their concerns. Yeah. So you, now that we can um, interpret this art to quite a large degree, uh, through the use of um, ethnography and kind of, you know, the informed approach sort of pioneered by Vinicum and Lewis Williams uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, that um, we can look at these and, you know, and we can use that as a, as a body of evidence in its own right, you know. And, um, and I think that's fantastic. We, we are able to understand um, these individuals because they're kind of, you know, small players on the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, over the overall sort of colonial processes, you know, a lot of the, the histories that write about the Eastern Cape during the colonial period are discussing the European, be they um, British or um, Dutch on the one side versus uh, Tosa on the other side. And that's kind of it. You, know, you don't hear so much stuff about um, these uh, smaller uh, groups of people who were desperately fighting for, you know, what was their land, um, which they were getting shoved off by, yeah, of course, the, the sort of the brutal uh, colonial processes of um, land expropriation, as, uh, and then also um, just the, the bloodshed that went into doing things like um, forcing people into uh, colonial labor, be that as kind of these uh, sort of illegal slaves, uh, forcing people to work as um, on uh, as farm hands, or also forcing them to join the uh, the colonial military institutions, which was another thing where they were treated horribly. So I mean, of course, they absconded, and what they take guns and horses. What can you do with that? You can rape. Yeah, that's what's fascinating. It's really interesting, and it's something you know going through a lot of varsity for us. Um, you know, sometimes we often learn about either you when you think of rock art, you think of hunt together art, Quaker art, um, Sukhothwana art. You know. So this is this whole additional aspect of art bringing through these identities that have sort of created by the colonial experiences and also in a way you know forgotten by the colonial records to some extent so but brent thanks very much it's it's really been super interesting uh, hearing your stories and stuff about all of this and the work that you've been doing it's it's great um and um hopefully some papers will come out soon i'm sure they will i'm definitely looking forward to reading them but thanks very much for joining awesome. thanks so much, yeah. best luck with the reviews Cheers. Thanks. Hey, no, thanks very much for this opportunity. This is cool. I like this. Thanks. Thanks, thanks very much. Really.